Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on safeguarding against hazards from machines. Um, today's presentation is going to be delivered by Richard Hellebrand. Um, Richard has worked um, as a chartered mechanical engineer in the process industries for more than 30 years. Um, for much of his career, he's been um, the responsible engineer at an upper tier coma site, um, delivering improvements in process safety, asset integrity, reliability and energy efficiency. Rich has extensive experience of process and machine safety from initial design through to decommissioning. He's a fellow of the IMECI and also a fellow of the Energy Institute. He's also an, a member of the IMECI's Bulk Materials Handling Committee. Richard is currently the Process Safety Management Superintendent for Westlake Vanilla, a German manufacturer of speciality um, polymers. Um, I'll now pass you over to uh, Richard to um, go through his webinar. webinar. Um, if you would like to ask any questions, we have a chat facility. Um, so if you type those questions into the chat facility, then we'll answer those questions at the, the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you. And over to you, Richard. Thank you, Tim. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, so I've, I've all engineered, operated, audited machines throughout my career, and I'd like to share some of the things I've learned. There are about 50 slides, so I need to crack through them quite quickly to fit them into the allocated time. Um, if you find I'm changing slides too quickly, you can replay the webinar um, recording when it's made available by the IMECI. I'm also happy um, if you want the PowerPoint file or a PDF of it, just send me an email um, to richard.hellebrand at member.imeki.org. It's on the screen. Um, and then I'll send you the, the actual file. Um, throughout this, I'm referencing various documents. Technical standards have to be purchased, so I haven't linked to them. You can find them just by through a search engine. Um, but the legal documents are generally free to download. Okay, so let's get into this. There's a bit of an agenda. So intro, uh, a little bit about injury rates, legislation, what to guard, the technical standards, different types of guards, how to make sure that guards are actually safe, some examples. Um, and then I'm going to finish off with a, an incident to show you what, what can go wrong. Um, Ever since the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s, machines have been killing them and injuring people. Um, you can see uh, this, this woolen mill, um, all the lovely nip points and belts um, that are available to kill and hurt people. Um, thankfully, we don't have to face unguarded machines like that anymore, what we shouldn't do. However, they're still dangerous. We're still legally responsible for ensuring safety at work. Um, so we've got to present, prevent people from reaching the danger zones. That needs a risk assessment and, and more about this later on. For simple machines, dangerous parts are obvious. So a, a fixed guard can be fitted. But for complex machines, the fixed guards aren't always practical. Um, so they might need adjustable guards and interlocks. And that's when we can get into trouble because people do need to access machines for cleaning, adjustment, lubrication. Well, have we designed those guards to allow that? Um, if not, people might modify the safeguards. They might distort the guards, bypass them, even remove the safeguards. So the presentation summarizes some legal requirements. This is UK centric, apologies for anybody in other countries, but. Um, there are similar legislation in other countries and the key technical standards which are international and it gives some practical examples. I'll also talk about a, an incident uh, packing um, machinery in the early 2000s when an operator died inside the machine because it's quite complex and it's perhaps more representative nowadays of the sort of environment we have in our factories. If we look at some work injury rates, um, you can see from that graph, this is from 1974 to sort of now, um, there's been a great reduction, um, but there are still 142 fatalities uh, in 2020-21. If you, if you look at the rate of uh, injury per 100,000 workers, this is 
since 81, that's a slightly different scale, about 40% reduction. Um, Oh, more than 40 percent isn't it so it, it looks good but, but we've got to be um, we can't be complacent deaths are still happening you know one death is a tragedy we should aim for zero um if you analyze um the 142 deaths um they're actually what were killed at work they weren't in machines when you look at contact with move, move machinery it's only 13 in the uk it's only that's still 13 tragedies um and but if you then look at non-fatal injuries, um, it jumps to more than 2,000. You know, for every touching or contact with a machine, move machinery, it could be a finger lost, an arm lost, or it could be a death. Um, luckily, we don't work in the US because in the United States in 2018, there were 6,000 amputations due to work accidents. Over half of those involved machinery. And the graph shows you that sort of split on machinery from wood and metal working um, through to construction. Far too many. All avoidable. OK, so I'm going to rattle through legislation as quickly as I can. It's an unfortunately boring but necessary topic. Um, it, it, went, it started off with the Factories Acts when all... Uh, you know, all these tens of thousands of people who were being injured and dying in the UK. Um, a whole series of um, regulations came over the years from 1800 to, to 1959, 150 years. But in 1961, they were consolidated into a single Factories Act. The key part was that every dangerous part of machinery was to be securely fenced. So at that point, they didn't have anything more complicated than, than nip points securely fenced um that was superseded a few years later in 1974 by the health um, and safety at work act and it's still in force today and that establishes principles for the management of health and safety at work it also allowed for the creation of regulations underneath it via statutory instruments or codes of practice you know and what that allows is the fact that we don't need parliament to meet to agree these the the nominated bodies like the health and safety executive um, can issue regulations. Um, and over the years, the European regulations were some sort of also incorporated into the UK regulations. Section two states it should be the duty of every employer to ensure as far as reasonably practical the health, safety and welfare at work of all his or her employees and in particular blah, blah, blah provision and maintenance of plant and systems of work that are so far as reasonably practicable, safe and without risks. So it's the employer's responsibility. Manufacturers and suppliers and designers have similar um, duties. That's in section six, but I'm not going to go through them. I'm concentrating on the people at the sharp end of using the machinery. Um, in 1992, the provision and use of work equipment regulations came in so that that comes underneath the health and safety work act um it was also amended in 98. um essentially these work equipment regulations are the same across europe despite brexit we still work to very very similar standards in every country in europe um so pure regulates the standards of safety for any machinery appliance apparatus tool or installation used at work the obligations don't just apply to employers, they, they also apply to employees, um, as well as those who sell the equipment. Um, Pure specifies that the work equipment must be suitable, maintained and inspected, used only as specified by trained people and fitted with suitable protective devices, markings and warnings. Um, regulation 11.2, talks about preventing access to dangerous parts of machines and the fact that employers need to risk assess our work equipment to see if it's possible to eliminate the safety risks. Um, a classic sort of hierarchy of this, if you can't eliminate the risks, then there must be some control measures, sort of in order of preference. So if you can't remove the risk, you should fit fixed guards, enclosing every dangerous part. 
But if that's not practicable, you can use other types of guards, like movable guards or protection devices. Uh, but if you can't do it completely with that, then trip type protection um, can also be used. If you can't use any of those, only then can you rely on procedures, information, instruction, training, and supervision. Always the last call. Always aim for the fixed guard and interlocks at the top. Equipment suppliers have got similar uh, requirements when they do the designs. So fixed guards have no moving parts and they're fastened in position. They've got to be robust, typically kept in place by means of bolts or, or other fasteners. So you can't open them without some form of tool. If you can just pull them off, they're not good enough. Um, should also have openings for regular access to grease points, adjusters, etc., cetera, um, providing people can't get digits or limbs inside those to reach the dangerous parts. There are other types of guards, movable guards that can be opened without tools uh, or guards, fixed guards that aren't fully enclosing. They allow limited access through openings, um, for example, to feed um, materials into machines for cutting, things like this, or cleaning, etc. They can be power operated, self-closing and adjustable, but they should also have interlocks so that um, the machine can't operate until the guard's closed. If the guard's open, the machine automatically stops. Um, and when the guard is closed, the machine will not automatically uh, restart. The interlocks have got to be difficult to defeat and must fail safe, i.e. stop the machine. And it's not just about power um, or movement, I should say. There are sources of potential energy, electricity and capacitors, pneumatic cylinders, um, that could leak and cause the machine to, to move, um, hydraulics, or just gravity. Something's at the top of its stroke and the power's turned off. Well, what's stopping it coming down? Is there a break on it? Um, protection devices, um, they don't provide access, uh, to prevent access to the danger zone, but they should stop the machine. So typically you might, you see these sorts of things on um, pillar drills where there's a little hanging down switch. If you knock it, it turns it off pressure-sensitive mats, inductive floor loops, two-handed controls, things like this. Um, and then finally, there's protection appliances. These are things like jigs. So for, if you can imagine uh, someone cutting planks on a big circular saw, the joiner will use something to push the plank into the saw. Hopefully, they won't use the hands to push it in. Um, only when the dangerous counts parts can't be protected by guards, then the employer has got to provide the information, instruction, training, supervision. Uh, HSC has published an excellent code of practice um, and guidance, L38. Look it up online. It's a free download. Safe use of work equipment. Right. Not too far off now. Um, in 2008, there was a specific um, regulation, supply of machinery regulations. This is basically implementing the machinery directive that the Europeans work to. And if we want to buy or sell machines into Europe, they have to comply with the machinery directive. So at the moment, there's no difference. In theory, you should only be able to buy machines that have got CE marks, they've got documents to go with them. Uh, and, th and those CE documents um, are supposed to I stress is supposed to guarantee compliance with the, the essential safety requirements in, in the machinery directive. Um, after Brexit in 2016, um, the EU Withdrawal Act was written, um, modifying the regulations so they could continue. Um, and most health and safety legislation is more or less unchanged despite Brexit. Um, so compliance with those regs means that essential health and safety requirements satisfied that there is a conformity assessment to demonstrate how it conforms with a certificate um, and that it's got suitable markings ce for the moment uk um, ca afterwards and i'll talk again about that so um pure and the machinery um regulations both reference the eu directives and at the moment it's got to comply with that C marking basically. Um, but 
C is due to be replaced by the UK um, CA. The schemes are very similar. Um, there have been various things going through Parliament um, to do this. And it's quite complex. So at the moment, um, C marking is still valid until the end of this year. Um, and we don't need UK CA marking until the end of the following year. That can change after this webinar. I don't know. But that's that's the current plan. Thankfully, that's the end of the discussion about the legals. Um, so let's just have a look at what we need to guard. Um, I'm going to concentrate on moving hazards. Uh, I know there's the possibility of electrocution uh, as well and, and other things um, like high pressure water cleaning and things like this. Um, but that's generally controlled by work control, things like permits to work, um, lockout, tag out, called lotto, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to concentrate on those. Otherwise, you'd be here for hours. So some um, simple pictures. Um, we've got classic um, gears or sprockets, depending on what they are. And the nip point is where it pulls your limb in. The same with some rollers, it pulls you in. Um, and that's for things in uh, opposite to direction. But um, there's plenty of tangential nip points as well. Um, you can drive belts on a pulley, uh, again, chains on sprockets um, and gears. Um, conveyor belts are also a classic where it's um, easy to get dragged in. Um, it's not just um, two sets of moving points, it can be a fixed point. Um, so uh, there's a screw feeder nip point there um, and a grinding wheel here. Um, this is an example. Um, actually, it's from Ajax equipment at Bolton and it's a, a triple hopper that I, I ordered to feed um, powder from a single silo into three separate packet machines, but evenly. So it had uh, in the top counter rotating screws um, to spread the powder around so it's even across the three outlets. Um, clearly there aren't any guards on, or not many guards on this because it was a factory acceptance test. Um, that's not how it should be in service, but let's hopefully, uh, hang on. Change the pointer option to normal and play. It's in silence. It was a few years ago. It was just done on my phone. But there are a lot of screw feeders in the world. Um, this was in chemicals and powders, but you could equally see this in food processing. Um, it, I've seen what happens with metal bars get trapped in and they will do a lot more damage um, to humans. I'm not going to play all of that. It's, it's, um, it's not too exciting, but um, it's a classic screw feeder. If you go on YouTube, you'll find plenty more of these sorts of videos. The problem is they've all got copyright, so I'm not going to use them. I'm only using my own materials. OK, and then we've got reciprocating parts. So typically an example might be a, a screen, a powder screen going backwards and forwards where you could walk through and, and, and get clattered. And then cutting machinery. Um, if you go in any workshop, you'll find these um, circular saws, drills, lathes, milling machines, um, shears, punches. And of course, nowadays, robots. Um, we have, we've all got robots, I think, just about, um, and they can move suddenly and they, you have to be very careful with them. They're not intelligent. Uh, so if you, to know more about how to design or what you look, should be looking for in these safeguards, um, there are lots of international standards, a lot of British standards that became European standards. So you have B -E -B -S -E -N, um, but also published in other countries. We have the ISO standards. Um, some of them are in America, some of them are in Europe. But again, 
international and often have a BS in front of them. When I looked in the British um, standards shop, I found nearly a thousand relating uh, to safety of machinery, but most of them are specific to designers. And for most of us, we're not designing complex machines. We're installing them, maintaining them, operating them. So I've tried to just summarize a few of the, the key standards. Um, ISO 12100 in 2010. So this has got general principles for design, risk assessment and risk reduction. Um, so lots of the information in there, pretty pictures um, showing you how to do things. Uh, there's also um, a, a document came out a couple of years later, practical guidance and examples of methods. So that helps implement that, that standard above. Um, this one, ISO 14120, um, talks about the requirements for design and construction of, of the guards themselves. It replaces an earlier standard, um, BS um, 953, very similar in many respects. Um, but in my opinion, this is essential reading. If you have guards and, and you're not sure what they should be like, or you need new guards, read ISO 14120. Um, you can guard by distance. So you can have a hole in a guard if, if you can put your arm through it and you can't touch the machine inside. And that's sometimes useful for cleaning, for example, or for greasing. But there are specific distances, safety distances, and there are tables and they're in this standard, ISO 13857. Um, also, a discussion I've had with health and safety executive on a number of occasions. Um, if your plant or process was designed 20, 30 years ago, you don't have to apply the very, very latest standard, British standard or ISO standard to everything. Um, you have to comply with what was state of the art at the time. Clearly, if there's a big gap um, in standards, then you should try and do something about it. But it's not mandatory. And then in continuous handling, this is just an example. There's a series of them, um, for example, for um, belt conveyors, silos, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, just do yourself a search. You'll find these things. But these are some of the key ones. OK, so some types of guard. This is a fully enclosed guard. Um, every, all of those gears um, are totally guarded. You can't touch them. They're fine. Not, nothing on that side, on the, on the right hand side, but the, but the main guard is, is in place. And these, as you can see, I've extracted these from this standard I mentioned, 14120. This is an in-feed guard for distance protection. And so you just can't get your arm close enough to do any harm. Um, this tunnel guard, usually with a foot switch or some other thing so that um, you know, you're not tempted to climb underneath and into it. Um, another example, distance guard here. Um, again, you can sort of reach over, but you can't reach far enough to hurt yourself. And then an interlocked gate for a robot. Um, so there should be some sort of electronic switch um, on that gate, um, on the lock, that when you open it, the machine stops dead and isolates it. I'll come back to this again. And then it gets more complicated. So this is, you can see, this has got several packing machines, um, a robot in there, conveyors, um, places where fork trucks go in and out. Um, so the whole series of different things, they've tried, you start off with the fences and the guards, but they're not always possible. So if you look at this B, there's a lot of interlocks. Um, there are there's pressure sensitive mats. So if you walk in, the machine should stop. Um, and there is a reset actuator as well. So if you walk in or stop it in any, any way, you have to come back outside to reset it. And that's intended to prevent um, you getting um, it automatically restarting when you're inside there. But it's not good enough. And I'll, I'll explain why. Um, 
shortly. So some examples. Um, this is just a pump guard, but you can see that nice red guard goes all the way around it. It's got an auto greaser through the top. And if you looked underneath, there's no gaps to the shafts. Um, another example of some complex um, safeguards. So you can see these yellow and black um, areas. That's where there are safety light curtains. So if you walk in, it trips the machine. Um, there can be laser scanners, safety switches, proximity sensors, all sorts of other and you can buy these and should buy these from people who sell safety devices, not just knock something up from RS components if, if you can avoid that, it's better. So some examples from my history, this, um, this um, again, I'll try and get the pointer working. So this was a palletizer uh, packing powder. You can just about see it on 25 kilo sacks in there. And then from the palletizer would go along powered roller conveyors to a turning conveyor and then come this way and then end up um, actually in a shrink wrapper just out of shot. Um, there's an inductive loop there for fork trucks. So if a fork truck went in to pull a pallet, a full pallet off for whatever reason or put one on, they could do that, would trip the machine and it would restart. But if a person tried to walk through, there are light beams. And the light beams um, stop the machine, but also, if for some reason, say the guy got off the fork truck um, and walked in, well, it, the machine stopped, um, but someone then come along and drives the fork truck away. Now he's in a live machine. So there are further light beams to prevent him or her walking through or crawling through into the other uh, dangerous parts of the machines. Um, just a point, don't put steps or pallets right next to fences. People use them as step ladders. Um, this is a bit more of a close up um, of the inductive loop and the um, and the light beam on this one. Um, this has got a pallet squasher as well. This this machine on the right um, again from the inductive loop. If you turn right, you could walk into this this hooding machine, um, but there's a light beam. Um, you can actually see the inductive loop on this one. You can see the, the change in color on the concrete. Um, so that allows people to, uh, use to fork trucks to go in and out uh, without stopping the machine. I mentioned um, that I wasn't happy that at least some of the complex systems are good enough. Switches on gates in themselves are fine, but if you go in through that gate and it closes behind you, someone comes along and says, oh, the gate's closed, I can restart the machine and they restart it from the outside. So best practice, um, put a, a key interlock on it that you take out of the, the, the control panel for it. Um, so when it goes in the lock to open it, the power's dead, the panel's dead, but also get your operators, your, your mechanics, to take that key, put it in their pocket when they go in. That way, even if they're hidden from view in the machine, no one is able to restart it from the outside. Okay, um, so how do we check that guards are safe? Well, some, some simple questions. Does it prevent access to moving components? Is the material adequate? Is it steel or strong plastic? Not flimsy. Um, is there any rubbing, sparks, sharp edges or holes? Is it loose? Are the bolts missing? Um, is it corroded? Can that create holes? And things do deteriorate over time. Um, a lot of equipment and plants are 30, 40, 50 years old nowadays. Can it be removed or flexed without tools? And if you find if people are finding defects, you need to discuss with the local supervisor and they should. Get those repaired immediately. This is, again, a bit of a hierarchy here. Get it. Stop it. Get it repaired immediately. If that's not possible, turn the turn the machinery off and isolate it. If that's not possible. Barrier and sign around the machine to physically restrict access until it can be repaired. 
no barrier tape is not enough it does not stop people going anywhere if you get someone injured because you put a bit of barrier tape around a guard or even a hole in the ground um, it is not a barrier you'll probably end up being prosecuted for it you need to put something physical drums scaffolding whatever people ignore barriers and then tell people what why what the problem is if there are serious defects suggest the also reform uh, inform the responsible maintenance or plant manager put it in writing to cover yourself it, it'll also help it'll add pressure for fast repairs this is an example um, of a quarterly guarding inspection so in the factory i was at um, we had a number of process areas with a technician nominally responsible for maintenance in each area and every three months they took their a4 folder list around and they went around every single guard and as we did modifications and added and removed machines we changed the list and they did a basic check about whether it was good or bad and if it was faulty they were allowed to go and sort it out um, arrange a purchase order get it replaced whatever um, clearly that is only a snapshot a polaroid if you like every few months but nevertheless it keeps an element of control it's obviously up to the day-to-day -day operating team and maintaining maintenance team to sort it out as they go along but it gives you a degree of confidence and it's an easy measure to implement some poor examples um this is a, a a lagged vacuum pump liquid ring vacuum pump the guard on the left doesn't look too bad except when you then look at it closer up you can see it's a classic sort of u-shaped around the, the shaft and the pulleys but there's a big hole under there you can put your arm in there straight into the pulleys um this is another vacuum pump viewed from the end um it's got gland packing so um, needed adjusting and nipping up from time to time so of course what's happened is someone's undone it and pulled the guard away so they can get in to do it without having to turn the machine off the solution to that was we fitted some new guards with slots in them and issued everybody with the right size i think it was 11 millimeter ratchet spanner that you could get onto the gland packing the gland followers so you, you, you can think there are um ways to improve these machines and then a classic conveyor belt um not mine or mine it's got a nice gate well what's the point of the gate <laughs> because the people need to access the electrical panel regularly and they're walking straight underneath this return idler which has got a nip point um also if you notice there's no trip wires above the conveyor belt it's standard practice to have a, a, a trip wire on a conveyor belt so if you do get dragged onto a conveyor you can yank at the green wire and it will trip it before you get fed into the muncher at the end of it so what was the point of the fencing of the gate i can't see any reason for it um this is when i was pulled up by the hsc they came and did an audit and you look at this little stirred tanker and think oh that's all right um it's got a garden on the drive yeah the problem is the HSC actually pulled us up on this tiny little area where the shaft rotates and you could put your hand on it. So um, I had to um, just fit a, a quick guard before they left site. Um, this, um, this was in Italy. Um, this was a, a bag squasher. When you fill loose powder into, into sacks and, and put them on a pallet, very often there's a lot of air in trains and over time it comes out and the, the sacks can become floppy and unstable. Um, so they get squashed to remove the air. But in this case, I think the, the fence on the left was about four or five feet high, it's too low. Not only that, you could just walk around it. Um, on the, the one on the right, um, the mesh was um, not even welded to the bottom. You could just push it aside. Um, in this particular case, much better design. It's got some um, photoelectric cells on the left um, to stop you going in. The problem is they start 800 mil, so near, you know, nearly three feet above the rollers. So there's nothing to stop an operator just crawling underneath into the machine. 
we have to design for i could say idiots that's the wrong expression humans humans make errors we all do it lack of judgment tiredness whatever else it is um some more examples oh these nice barriers yeah but <laughs> it doesn't stop you walking into this turning conveyor and it, when it turns um 45 degrees there's a, a nip point and then sort of final one on, on photos um these were brand new pumps that i purchased high pressure 300 bar water pumps piston pumps they look great yeah except if you look under those gray guards over the pulleys big big holes i could put my arm straight into the couplings so um they got replaced they might have come with us come a C conformity certificate, some nice plates, but they were replaced with nice new guards. So don't be complacent. Um, just because it says it's compliant, it's your legal responsibility to make sure it is, um, as well as the manufacturers. Final, um, final slide. Um, I won't say where it was, but uh, you, you probably noticed I've had like a lot of experience on um, powder packing machinery. Um, so this is another example. So on the um, on the left, we have a palletizer. So empty pallets are going in, sacks are being put on top until the 12 layers are in, and then it goes on the powered conveyor. Um, and then um, a bag squasher um, and shrink wrapper, etc. So In this particular one, um, it needed to remove a pallet um, from it. So the fork truck driver uh, pulled a chain to, do act, to act, deactivate the light beam for 20 seconds. And clearly this happened and the fork truck driver went in and did it. Um, but then they found him dead in the palletizer, squashed. We don't know exactly what happened, but it's likely he entered the machine to clean dust from the optical sensors. That's always a problem in dusty environments with uh, with light beams that they get, get dust in them. So the machine wasn't properly isolated. Um, when he cleared the fault on the light beam, the machine automatically restarted. So, so why? And the, the investigation identified a few things. The operators had physically bodged the interlock on the gate so they can open and shut it without using it. Obviously, they could use the fork truck to defeat the light beam trip. I've showed you that. And they'd also completely unbolted a fence panel, allowing free access like an extra an extra gate. The operator was not aware of the risks. He'd actually only been in place for a few weeks and he'd watched other people doing these things and thought, well, we assume thought that was a safe thing to do. It's not. Everyone needs proper induction. And it really comes down to, to us, the managers, engineers of these things. We can't just fit and forget. We've got a duty, a responsibility to keep an eye on things like this called Brothers Keeper. So it wasn't really because of the machinery defects, because everything was in place. It was poor design, poor training, poor safety checks, and poor management. So uh, it's been a bit of a whistle stop tour through um, legislation and uh, rights and wrongs of guarding in some examples. Um, if you want a CPD certificate, just uh, email Murat, is, uh, Murat at IMECI, and you can get one. Again, if you want the slides, um, email me direct or just wait for the webinar um, to be published. Uh, hopefully not too fast for you, but um, that's my 40 minutes. So um, I think back to you, Tim. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for the uh, presentation. Uh, really interesting and uh, a good job keeping to uh, time as well. 
Um, so yeah, we'll now we'll now take some questions. So um, yeah, like I say, if you've got any that you've not answered yet, then yeah, feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll go through some of the ones that are here at the moment. So um, the first one is. I'm a rotating equipment engineer and witnessed many issues with coupling guards and pumps despite their design meeting international standards. Could you please advise how those can be improved and what amendments are recommended in the design codes? I guess that's a question for me. <laughs> it's what I showed you with that Hamelman. Um, oh, I shouldn't have mentioned the manufacturer, but I have, haven't I? Never mind. Um, so you know let me just share this this one slide again um this one here so it, as i said this is only a couple of years ago um i've seen so many of these and i i do quite a lot of auditing in europe um every plant i got every plant have got almost new machines all sorts of manufacturers um purchased and built in europe italy germany spain imported from the US, China, Japan, and they all seem to do this. You, when you get it, you just have to you just have to get it fixed. The problem is good luck trying to get the manufacturers um, to say that they're wrong and they haven't done it sufficiently because clearly someone is signing off. A lot of um, the conformity certificates are, are self-conformity, um, but just check them. Uh, I've had machines delivered, where uh, pumps delivered, where they've said, Oh, they'll be fully tested and then you look well there aren't any mechanical seals in them so how did you manage to do that then <laughs> you know people they actually lie or perhaps not lie is the wrong to it but um it's complex and people make mistakes so you just have to insist okay. uh, have another question um... Okay, so yes, yeah, so I um, question is: I work in a research department in the university's engineering faculty, where many pieces of equipment are prototyped or continuously being modified. Do these regulations apply to these types of research establishments, or are or are there exceptions? There are no exceptions that I'm aware of. We have a, a duty to make sure our people are safe. Just because you're in your lab and like chemistry sets, you know, it's they have to be done safe. And there's a people like to get things moving and do them quickly, but um, it's got to be safe. Okay. Okay. So yeah, we've got another one. So um, you mentioned that older machines don't need to necessarily conform uh, with the newer standards. What happens if those machines are sold locally? Do the owners have to review the conformity? Um, I don't know is the answer. Um, uh, but I've bought and sold secondhand equipment. I'm sure other people have. Um, it's whoever operates, owns and operates, it's their responsibility. So you, you wouldn't knowingly sell, sell a dangerous machine or a machine without a guard. Or if you did, you'd tell them it hasn't got a guard. You need to sort that out. That's the advice. Okay, just a so yeah, another one on on uh, training. So, do I need special training regarding safeguards? Um, no. I mean, training is good, um, but if you've got a little bit of experience, training makes a lot more sense. Um, Training to people who don't know anything about machines is probably a waste of time because it's theoretical. Um, but you don't need special training. Um, if you look at the, um, I think it was L38, the ACOP that I mentioned, the proof code of practice, sorry, um, and look at Pure, there's a lot of information about how to do things safely. Um, and it's just common sense that the, the, the main point is you shouldn't be able to reach the moving machinery that's it that is that is the guidance really now there's a hierarchy fixed guards other guards trips etc but essentially if you can touch it there's something wrong um you don't need training for that you just need you, you can look up the british standards and things 
if you want a reference for that but pure should in the uk pure is the reference and in europe there's an equivalent in every country and in, even in the us osha have something very very similar um so people should be aware of that in the us okay um i think we've just got one final question if no others come through um oh no we've got a few others uh, uh what should i do if i see poorly guarded machinery in use um don't ignore it <laughs> but it depends on your personality really some people are introverted some people are extroverted you know they might get flack if they talk to the operator so a safe way um report it to the local supervisor whoever the supervisor in that area is um and follow up in writing or an email to the manager and just say oh, I, I told bill by the way that guard's not right so you're in you've covered yourself and you know you've discharged this like responsibility of being a brother's keeper here um if you if you're confident or you have a good relationship with the operators in the area then talk to them they might not realize um that's quite hard it depends on your on, on the personality and the organization but um once you've reported it you can't do an awful lot more if you're in a more powerful position i'd turn it off but that's me <laughs> but it depends where you are and what your level of responsibility is um okay yeah we've got we've got a few more questions that have come through that we'll we'll, we'll go through so um yeah you talked about um it's kind of the application of of, of pure being uh, kind of common sense to a certain extent. But one of the questions is, is there actually an equivalent sort of process to a hazard process that you can use to assess the safety of uh, complex machine systems? Um, well, I, I, I don't know whether it, it probably is, but I can't remember what it, well, sorry. If you look into ABB who have the six stage HAZOP process, and if you read their guidance notes on HAZOP 3, I think it is, which is the traditional HAZOP, there is machinery has up so there are guide words for that the other two approaches um I, which i've used um fmea failure modes and effects analysis so what you do is you take a cross section of the machine with all the things labeled and you just go through each point and say you know can i reach that what happens if it breaks what safeguards can i put in place so that's another way and then the other thing you can just i call it a pure risk assessment there are um i knocked up a word document years and years ago that asked all the questions that pure includes so that even someone who doesn't know about pure can walk around a new machine or an old machine and just list what's wrong with it uh, and that drives actions um i haven't shared that um, if anybody wanted it in particular i could probably dig it out and email it you but um I won't put it on the general resources because it was a company specific thing. Okay. We have one, uh, I guess it's not quite a question, but more of a comment to a certain extent. So um, many safety related components, i.e. guards, interlocks, safety relays um, from German manufacturers have very long lead times at present and are just not available. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I agree entirely. Um, but listen if you if you are looking for some sil3 rated xenon barrier or whatever or a switch or something else it's better to put in something from rs you can get tomorrow I t I, there are other suppliers are available of course <laughs> um because you put something in place while you wait for the safety rated one to turn up because you have to control risk and in risk control is never perfect there's always probability times consequence for a score so you know if, if we put in something it's got to be 10 times better than not doing anything okay okay um yeah so i think that's the that's the last of the question i think there was just one more which was around what was the the cpd um email so i think just before we close up if you maybe just share um, yeah, that let me slide just again, share that again on the screen. Can you see that slide? Yep, yep. So it's Murat oh. Islam or dot Islam, sorry, at member dot org. Okay. 
And if you've got that, again, if anybody wants anything or follow up, then I've got an I, IMEC email address as well. Same format, richard.hallebrown. Happy to talk to anybody about safety. Yeah, so I think uh, yeah, I think that's that's the that's the end of the um, that's the end of the question. So yeah, just like to say thanks again, um, uh, Richard. Really interesting talk and some and some great questions. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. And um, yeah, the uh, the recordings will be available uh, shortly. Thank you for listening. Thanks for the questions, everyone. Really interesting.